I'm Ryan Brown. I'm the director of the Masters Academy of Art, and uh, this is just an ongoing uh, series where I'm talking about materials that I use. Uh, I suggest st that the students here uh, use them, but that doesn't mean they're the only valid ones out there, uh, especially when it comes to color. Uh, there's so many brands, there's so many different uh, colors uh, that you can use to get to uh, similar effects. Um, my suggestion for students when they are starting out in color is to pick a somewhat limited range uh, of colors and get extremely familiar with those. Uh, you just don't want to be uh, um, fumbling around too much when you're trying to mix to a certain color. If you're plein air painting, if you're working on a portrait, a figure, you'd like to uh, feel confident and comfortable with the colors that are on your palette um, and that you know how they're going to react to each other, you know their tinting strengths, uh, you know their drawing times. Uh, so, so my suggestion is always to pick a, a, a basic palette, start with that, get really familiar with it, and occasionally start bringing in other colors and experimenting and seeing which ones you like, which ones uh, really work for you. Uh, and, and then slowly kind of expanding your, your color palette that way. Um, my color palette has changed somewhat over time. Uh, for the last few years, it's been about the same. But uh, I, I have, this is almost all the colors I would use uh, for, for anything, but it's certainly not um, my general color palette. My general color palette is, is uh, relatively limited. Um, so uh, I'll just talk about the different whites that I use first. Um, my go-to always, always, always is lead white number one by Natural Pigments, Rublev. Um, it's, uh, uh, what is it, lead carbonate, and this is mixed in linseed oil. Um, the Natural Pigments tends to dry a little bit faster, so um, I will often um, mix it with an RGH, um, which is the same thing. It's a, it's a lead, basic lead carbonate, PW1. Uh, this is also in linseed oil. Uh, this is a little bit more buttery. This is uh, maybe a little bit stringier. I like the properties of both, uh, really. So what I've started to do um, is, is put them both out on my palette and do a 50-50 mixture, which gives me the best of both worlds. It's very buttery, but it has a, that light stringiness. Um, the RGH tends to dry much slower. Uh, the Rublev dries much faster. So um, I'm extending the life by maybe a day uh, of, the, of the natural pigments, but I'm, I'm, fa I'm making it uh, dry much faster than RGH would uh, by itself. So again, I'm getting the best of both worlds there. Um, I also use a lead white number two by Natural Pigments if I want the paint to dry a little bit slower. The lead white number two is mixed with walnut oil and walnut oil is a, is a slower dryer than linseed oil. Um, so I, I also really like that. Um, when I'm laying something in, I don't always do this, but uh, uh, Natural Pigments has made a lead white fast drying alkyd uh, for underpainting. This, if, if you're gonna try this, it's only, only, only supposed to be used for that first layer. I might do it on, a, on a, an initial lay-in of a painting I know is not gonna take very long, 30, 40 minutes, because within about 45 minutes, this stuff is, is too tacky to use, it's, it's dry. That's one of the benefits, because you can lay in a painting, um, and within an hour, you can go in for a second layer, which is, which is pretty awesome for oil paint. Um, again, I don't always use this, but it comes in handy every now and again when I'm working on small paintings and want to get that, uh, that first layer uh, to dry and tack up a little bit faster. They also make a stack flake white, which is unbelievable. This is the old masters, uh, what the old masters would have used. That's where they, they take the coils of lead and they put them in horse manure for however long until it flakes off and then they they collect that and grind it, and, and um, so this is the this stack flake white is is like the best of all worlds. Um, it's amazing stuff. So those are the those those are the whites that I typically use every day. Um, all of them lead whites, different variations of lead white. Um, 
Okay. Uh, the, the, well, I guess I should say the reason I use lead white is it's a little bit uh, more subtle. It's not as powerful as titanium white. Uh, also, the, the, um, the chemical adherence with the lead is much stronger. The tensile strength is much stronger with lead. So uh, I feel like it gives my paintings a greater potential at longevity um, or archival quality to have that, that uh, stronger adherence that the lead offers. Um, okay, so moving into the colors, um, I have a cad yellow light uh, from Gamblin that I use. Uh, typically, I will use that for like sunset paintings. Um, if I'm painting flowers, uh, I use that. Uh, anything where I need that really rich, bright yellow. Uh, the other one I use is a uh, Rublev Chrome Yellow Primrose. These are almost interchangeable, except when you're painting it like a really clean yellow in a sunset. Uh, chrome yellow primrose tends to just lean a tad towards the green. And so if I'm doing sunset, I uh, typically would use a cad yellow light for that. Um, then for really subtle flesh tones, uh, I, I have lemon ochre. I don't always use this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll break this down into colors that are always on my palette and then colors that are sometimes on my palette. Uh, the lemon ochre is a sometimes color. Uh, it's a much more subtle ochre, yellow ochre, uh, which is beautiful for like really fair skin flesh tones. Uh, then the, the main yellow ochre that I use is this Blue Ridge yellow ochre, which is a, a much richer uh, yellow ochre. Um, it's super versatile. I use this Gosh, on every single painting, uh, every subject, every painting. Then I have a cad orange. Also, the way that I'm laying these colors out is exactly how I would lay them out on my palette as well. So, so they're very organized, typically from lighter, warmer colors to darker, cooler colors. Um, OK, so uh, cad orange is something that I use almost only in sunset paintings. I have used it somewhat in, in like maybe some flower paintings or a um, couple other various uses, but typically this is not on my palette unless I'm painting a sunset. Orange molybdate is, uh, it's sort of like cad red light, only like in my opinion way better. This is Rublev again. It is like a really warm red. Uh, it's so much better than cad red light in my opinion, because it retains its warmth when mixed with white, which is really nice. I use this in flesh. I use it in landscapes. I use it in sunsets. I use it in red rock paintings, uh, you know, in the desert. I use it for everything. This is a, this is a great color. Genuine vermilion is an um, expensive color, but amazing. It's, it's a more earthy red that uh, is kind of a middle value. Um, but I use this for flesh uh, quite a bit. I don't use it as much in landscape painting because I, I don't uh, find it as useful. Also, because it's so expensive, um, I just use the orange molybdate. I tend to use orange molybdate a little bit more in landscape painting. Um, but uh, Genuine Vermilion is a great color. Uh, Alizarin Permanent by Gamblin is something I use quite a bit. Um, it's, a, it's a great more permanent version of Alizarin Crimson. I also use um, Matter Lake by uh, Rublev. Uh, I, I probably prefer the Rublev a little bit more than the, than the Alizarin Crimson Permanent, um, but I don't think they make it anymore, so I, I have to kind of um, start shifting over to using this a little bit more. I still have a couple of tubes of this, uh, so that's what I use more often. Uh, then moving into the greens, uh, this is a cinnabar green. It's a very vibrant green. Actually, I have a little bit, because you can't really see that on the tube, but I have a little bit here. It's a super vibrant green. Um, it's not something I use all the time. Of course, in landscape painting, almost never in uh, figure painting, unless for some reason they're wearing a you know, bright green t-shirt or something. Um, but it's a little bit richer than if I were to use like a sap green and a cad yellow light to get it to get that rich uh, green. It has a little bit more like 
I don't know what I would say, volume to the color, uh, ch chroma to the color, rich chroma. Um, and so it's a nice color. Again, I don't always use it, um, but when I need it, it's, it's great to have. Um, this, the green I use typically most is this sap green by Gamblin. It's a mixture uh, of Indian yellow, phthalo blue. And um, so it's a really strong sap green. It's darker and more transparent than most of the other sap greens I've used. And, so, and that's why I like it. It's the transparency and the, it's the richness of the color that I really like uh, in the sap green. So um, that's what I use as kind of like my starter green and then I you know, mix a lot of stuff into it to, to alter the, uh, how green it is. Uh, another green I use is uh, Viridian. Uh, by Gamblin, and uh, it's kind of a bluer, more subtle green. Typically with this, I'll use it in skies, which might seem counterintuitive, but as that blue kind of comes down to the horizon and gets a little bit more green, this is a great color for that. Uh, I also use this a lot in like seascape paintings when you're getting that rich green colors, those rich green colors in the, um, in the water. Um, but generally, for landscape painting, I don't find myself reaching for this very often, uh, except for skies and water. Another one for skies and water that is really beautiful is this Rublev Cobalt Chromite Blue. Um, I think this is, I think in talking to George, this is basically like the, what they call cerulean now. It's like a genuine cerulean blue. It's super beautiful, pretty, pretty strong and potent. Um, again, pr I probably use it mostly in skies and uh, seascapes, but it's a beautiful color. Uh, and then also for skies, and I use this kind of all around, I'll even use it in the figure sometimes, is just Gamblin's Cobalt Blue. It's a great rich uh, blue, it's a little bit lighter tone, a little bit greener. Um, and typically for skies, uh, it, you know, a, a, a bright blue sky, I'll go for that combination of cobalt and viridian. Uh, the other blue I use all the time, um, one of the colors I use most is Old Holland's Ultramarine Blue Deep. Uh, I like the Ultramarine Blue Deep because it's darker, it's richer, and it, it, it leans a little bit more towards the purple than a regular Ultramarine Blue. A regular Ultramarine Blue, ultimately for me, uh, felt a little bit greener than I wanted. Um, and so this Ultramarine Blue Deep is uh, what I use on everything. Uh, also this Gamblin Asphaltum, which is also a mixture of transparent Mars red and bone black. Um, this is a great sort of red, reddish brown, but super dark, super transparent. Um, and I use this, a combination of this and the Ultramarine Blue Deep to make almost all of my grays, all, all of my, um, uh, dirt color, I use it in skies, I use it in to get my blacks. Most of the blacks I get are, are a combination of these two. Uh, and then every variation of gray uh, is, is a combination of these two. And I can make the gray a little bit warmer with a little bit more asphaltum, a little bit cooler with the blue. Um, th these two colors together are really versatile. If I do use black, I use Rublev's Bone Black. Um, I don't use black often because uh, you know I get most of what I want out of those two uh, colors. But uh, when I do, uh, I use I use Rublev's Bone Black. Okay, so let me let me pare this down to what I have on my palette every day. Um, I typically don't have these yellow colors because uh, I don't find that I always need that that brightness. Um, I don't always have the lemon ochre. I don't always have the cad orange. I don't always have the vermilion. Um, I usually only have one of the, the cool reds, let's say Matter Lake for now, because I still have that, and I prefer that. I don't have the cinnabar. This, I don't have viridian, cobalt, chromite blue, or bone black, or cobalt. So these are my sometimes colors. And along with lead white, these are my always colors. So the always colors are lead white, blue ridge yellow ochre, orange molybdate, matter lake or alizarin crimson, uh, sap green, ultramarine blue deep, and asphaltum. And I can get almost everything I need with 
those seven colors. Seven colors including the lead white. Um, it's, only, it's only when I need things for specific reasons that I would pull in the, uh, these other colors. Um, so that's the colors. Those are the colors I use. Try them out. Um, see what you think. Uh, uh, like I said before, the, this is not an absolute uh, color uh, palette. It's just what, over the years, what I've come to find works well for me. Okay, now I'll get into mediums really quickly. Um, when I'm going out painting, I like to use oleo gel by Rublev. It, the reason I like to use that is because oleo gel is basically just linseed oil. But it's mixed with fumed silica, which makes it into a gel. But the fumed silica is inert, so it doesn't affect your painting at all. It's basically like taking a bottle of refined linseed oil out with you, except you can squeeze it on your palate and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and so uh, in the studio, I typically am just dipping my brush into refined linseed oil as I'm painting. But out in, um, on location, I use the oleo gel. And they make it in linseed oil and walnut oleo gel as well. Walnut if you want it to you know, take a little bit longer to dry. Uh, I also, when I'm traveling, I'll take a Venetian medium, which is, uh, let's see if I can read this, medium made with walnut oil, linseed oil. Uh, it's, it's linseed oil and leaded crystal glass. Um, what I like about it is that it dries a little bit faster. And I like the idea of adding lead to whatever mixture I'm, I'm using because, again, lead has a much uh, stronger binding power. Uh, so um, I'll take this with me when I'm traveling um, to, to try and speed up the drying time. Um, you know, it's hard to travel with wet, with wet paintings. So um, I really like that stuff. Uh, in the studio, typically, just the refined linseed oil. And then the oil I use for, med um, for oiling out is Rublev's Oil Medium Number no. 1. And uh, the reason I use this is it's a vacuum-bodied linseed oil mixed with uh, spike oil. Spike oil is like lavender oil, so you're going to get that smell, which is I like. So other people don't like it, but I like it. Um, the the vacuum-bodied oil is like a stand oil, but it's, um, it's done through a, a heat vacuum process that oxidizes the oil. So when your oil is is more oxidized, it tends to sink in less. So if I'm going to oil out a surface, uh, there's, there's two things I think about um, when oiling out a surface. Am I going to be painting into it, or am I just oiling it out so I can see the values and colors so that I can judge whatever I'm painting over here against a proper color and value uh, on other areas of canvas. If I'm just oiling out knowing I'm not going to immediately paint into that, I want to make sure that I'm not using too much oil on the surface. Um, so the, the vacuum body or the, the medium number one um, is a 50-50 vacuum bodied oil and spike oil. Spike oil is a very strong uh, solvent. So it, like if you just have straight spike oil, and you wanted to strip the paint off a surface, you could, you could just rub that on there and it's going to take the paint off. It's much stronger than mineral spirits. That cuts the vacuum bodied oil because the vacuum bodied oil is like, like honey. Um, it's, it's super viscous. So um, that cuts it and makes it a little bit more liquid. Um, but it also means that you're, you only have 50% oil in here, which is great if you're oiling out. Um, so if you mix that again, what I do when I'm oiling out is I mix it 50-50 with mineral spirits. So now I'm down to only a quarter percent oil. So I, I put that on the surface very thinly just to bring out the colors and values. And, uh, and then if I feel like there's too much, I can, you, I can wipe that off a little bit with a rag. Um, again, I don't want to leave a, a thick film of oil on the surface. Um, and l allow that to dry and have to come paint back over that later. So I'm, I'm careful about how I uh, oil out with this. Uh, but the good thing is once it does dry, it doesn't sink in again. So I'm not going to have to continue oiling out and oiling out and oiling out. Uh, but also, if I am going to paint into a dry surface, uh, a lot of times I want that. You know, if I'm painting the texture of rocks or dirt or whatever, I, I may want to drag that brush with wet paint over a dry surface and create that dry brush texture. 
But oftentimes, uh, if I'm going back into a portrait or a very subtle area, and I'm just trying to create uh, more subtle transitions or, or whatever, um, painting onto a dry surface can be complex. Um, so when I, I put down some of this oil medium number one, very thinly again, and it creates what's called a couch. And um, it's the closest you can get to painting wet into wet when you're painting over a dry surface. It, cre it, it creates, you know, if I, if I were to do the same thing with straight linseed oil or walnut oil or whatever, it creates a very slick surface that it, it, um, it's almost like the brush wants to slide across the surface instead of uh, the surface grabbing the paint. This because of the, um, the greater viscosity of the uh, vacuum bodied oil, it, it creates a little bit more of a grab, almost like the paint underneath is wet. Um, so when I'm painting on top and I'm trying to create those transitions, it's such a beautiful feeling uh, under the brush to, and makes it much easier to work into that uh, previous dry layer. So uh, I use this all the time. And those are the, those are the mediums that I use. I try to keep it simple, um, basically just linseed oil. Um, the only difference between these, these two is that this is vacuum bodied oil. Uh, and this is just uh, refined linseed oil. Um, but those are, those are basically all the mediums that I use when painting.